We'll start with COVID-19 because the head of the World Health Organization has repeated his warning that this pandemic is getting worse. He says too many countries are heading in the wrong direction. Here's the latest from the WHO briefing. We need to reach a sustainable situation where we have adequate control of this virus without shutting down our lives entirely or lurching from lockdown to lockdown, which has a hugely detrimental impact on societies. I want to be straight with you. There will be no return to the old normal for the foreseeable future. Now, one of the fundamental challenges of this pandemic is how little we know about what COVID-19 is doing to the human body. And, of course, many thousands of scientists are working to correct that. And on today's Outside Source, we want to focus on a number of pieces of new research. For example, we know the virus affects the lungs. Well, new research suggests it can affect the heart, too. This study is by Edinburgh University and the British Heart Foundation. It looked at heart scans from more than 1,200 patients in 69 countries. More than half of the scans showed heart problems. One in seven showed severe abnormalities likely to have a major effect on their survival and recovery. And the majority of these patients had no known heart disease before the scans were done. That includes a man called Pietro Marino. This was his experience. Then after the second the relapse, uh, I, I basically isolated, getting better. Uh, I didn't have any temperature anymore. And uh, I went back to my normal life, including uh, a bit of running uh, and cycling. But uh, Sunday, boom, something happened. I was cycling with my, my partner and uh, I started to have a very high palpitation with uh, chest, uh, with the pain on my chest, on my left arm, and I start having like a tunnel vision. So my partner called the ambulance and the ambulance came and I was admitted to the hospital where they found my troponin level high with uh, some irregularities on the ECG. Well, a third of the patients who were part of this research had their treatment changed as a result of these heart scans. Professor Mark Dweck led the research. In the patients that have severe infections, um, a reasonably high proportion will um, have complications affecting the heart. And I think it's important that we're aware of that in, in the patients that are in hospital, because if we do pick these patients up, it's actually an opportunity for us to get patients better because we have very good treatments uh, to help uh, the heart uh, pump better if it's impaired. And so here's an opportunity for us to uh, accelerate patients' recovery and to get them out of hospital and back to normal life quicker. So if that's how coronavirus can affect the heart, this next research looks at how COVID-19 can damage the entire body. Columbia University in New York has reviewed data from patients around the world. It's found the virus is affecting the heart and the lungs, but also several other organs. Here's Dr. Akriti Gupta, who worked on this review. In a substantial proportion of patients, not all, but I would say a very significant proportion, we were noticing a lot of blood clots, a lot of patients with high blood sugars, even if they did not have diabetes. And many patients were experiencing damage to their hearts, kidneys, brain, and even gut. That is what led us to believe that we need to really understand COVID as a multi-system illness, particularly in severely ill hospitalized patients. And, of course, these kind of conclusions would have major implications for treatment of COVID-19. Here's Dr. Gupta again. Through a clot to their lungs, something that we call pulmonary embolism, their care will not end at the time they get discharged. They will then need to be on blood thinners for a significant amount of time. They will need to be followed up in clinics after that. Similarly, a lot of patients, at least 10 to 15 percent of patients were requiring new dialysis when they're getting hospitalized. So now a certain people will recover, but there are others who are going to go on to requ require dialysis for life. Next, the crucial issue of immunity. One of the hopes for slowing this virus is the more people who get it, the more people are immune to it. But a new study cast doubt on that theory. Scientists at King's College London have found patients who've had COVID-19 and then have lost their immunity within months. Now, this research is based on the experience of over 90 patients and healthcare workers. 60% of patients had what's called a potent antibody response, but only 17% of them maintained those antibody levels three months later. And without those antibody levels, you can get the virus again. 
Here's Professor Robin Shattuck from Imperial College London reacting to this study. If you've been infected with the virus, you're less likely to get severe disease if you're reinfected. So it's quite likely that you'll have a level of immunity that may well protect you from serious disease, but you may still be infectious uh, and be a source of transmission to other vulnerable people. And that's what's important in terms of public health implications. Here's another virologist reacting to this piece of research. Most importantly, uh, this reads, it puts another nail in the coffin of the dangerous concept of herd immunity. That's the idea that when a certain percentage of a community becomes immune, the virus can no longer flourish. Well, this research on immunity also has implications for vaccine development too. Here's Professor Shattuck again. There's a very clear distinction between natural infection and a vaccine. Natural infection is very variable in terms of the immune response that it induces because you're getting different doses of a virus. Whereas a vaccine, everybody gets the same dose and we're looking for a very consistent immune response across the population. But there may well be a requirement for an annual booster along the same lines as we see for influenza. And we need to make sure that we are ready and prepared to be able to deliver that should that be required. Next to a potential treatment for COVID-19, which is coming from an unusual source, llamas. It's thought that antibodies in llamas can be engineered to neutralise the virus in sick patients and also used to boost their immunity. Now, you can read all about this uh, from the BBC science correspondent Victoria Gill on the BBC News website. The research is being led here in the UK and could enter clinical trials within months. And Victoria's live with us from Manchester now. I mean, I guess the first question, Victoria, would simply be how did they even think to look in llamas to, to find something that might help us? <laughs> So actually the, the, the template for this whole kind of making antibodies in the lab, the fact that it comes from llamas and also alpacas, any kind of camel species, these related species, um, it comes from a discovery that happened in the 1980s, basically looking at these animals' blood um, and looking at their antibodies. They're, they work in the same way as ours, but they're structurally quite different. They're much simpler, essentially. Um, and so these researchers at the Rosalind Franklin Institute started looking at whether these llama-derived antibodies could be made to be potent against against the coronavirus, against COVID-19. Um, because the, key, the trick with that is that because they're much simpler molecules, they can be engineered and produced in the lab. So it's basically making those antibodies that you were just talking about to treat people with this, they call it passive immunization. Basically, you give people the antibodies so that their body doesn't have to make them. Um, and making them out of these llama antibodies means that they can be engineered pretty quickly, pretty simply. And what they've published in this latest research um, from the Rosalind Franklin Institute is that they can make these antibodies very potent against COVID-19. It does attach to and sort of lock onto the virus and kill the virus very effectively. So they're hoping that these, they call them nanobodies because of their relatively small size. They're hoping that these would be, enter, be able to enter clinical trials within months, which gives a, a prospect of treating some of the sicker patients who do get quite severe disease. And you mentioned those trials and the fact that they'll need months in and of themselves. I guess that highlights the broader challenge for science here. The world is calling out for some help with this pandemic, but this scientific work takes time. This is it. You know, the, the research is kind of how we get back to any sense of normality. And, and really, the you know, the panacea is the vaccine, is being able to, to give, a, a, give immunity, to, to inject people with a vaccine and provide immunity for a large number of people and protect everybody. Um, but really, we're still learning so much so very quickly, but we've had to learn very quickly because, you know, this is still, it's a novel new disease. The genetic code was sequenced in January. And, you know, here we are in July and we have 200 different just vaccination development programs programs in the offing. So it just shows how incredibly fast the science, the pace of the science has moved. You know, just a few years ago, you would be looking at years to decades to produce a vaccine. And that's just one element of what we're developing and learning. But there is a long way to go. And I think as your, your intro really kind of summed up, we open more questions than we do answers as scientists probe into this disease.